Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door, and I'm excited to give you this on the road episode with Nature at Your Door. And today I've landed in Tarpon Springs, Florida. This is the sponge capital of the world, and it's so cool to see this both from a natural history perspective, a cultural perspective, an economic perspective. This is a really fascinating place to be. Today's episode is about sponges. I'll give you a little background about the natural history of sponges and talk about what's behind me here, the sponge industry, and give you a little bit of history of sponges and how it came about and how this industry is still thriving today. So stay tuned. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're gonna find. So let's begin this episode talking about what sponges are. And I have a number of sponges right here that I collected, not from the boats, but from the beach that were washed up myself. So you can see sponges come in many shapes, many sizes, many colors, uh, just a huge variety of these sponges. So these sponges are not plants, but actually animals. And they are sessile animals, meaning they don't move around. And these sponges grow by attaching uh, to rocks and hard things on the bottom to keep them from washing away and keep in one place. What we're seeing here is really the inner skeleton of sponges. So this is an internal skeleton of a sponge. And if these were alive right now and underwater, they would be covered with a living skin. And on this living skin, or making up this living skin, would be tiny cells with flagella on them, which uh, are like little tails that are part of the cell. They're muscular, and they can create current. And then there's filter feeding cells that will pull in materials that this current has pulled in. And if we looked at this in the ocean, we'd see the current moving into all these pores and sometimes moving out through a larger pore called the X current pore. The internal part is made of a gelatinous mass of living tissue. So by the time you pick up one of these sponges at the beach, the elastic skin on the outside of this internal skeleton is gone. The gelatinous material inside that they call the guri is, uh, has rotted, long rotted away and been washed and tossed in the ocean. So when these live sponges are collected, they are uh, kept wet under burlap bags uh, with seawater. Um, they start to rot away, and the sponges are pounded and squeezed and pounded and squeezed countless times by the uh, sponge divers. And then they're left out to dry and then further processed and cleaned from there. Sponges have been harvested for thousands of years. The ancient Greeks and Romans used sponges for bathing, for cosmetics, and for cleaning just like we do. And of course, we now have commercial manufactured artificial sponges, but many still value these original natural sponges as they find them best for bathing. Like I said, they're natural, they're hypoallergenic, and they also have a bit of an abrasive property because these sponges are still made up of the silica-based internal skeletons. So people enjoy these unique cleansing properties in baths and showers, and apparently these are naturally antibacterial, and they will last for years and years. The sponge industry had been based for centuries in the Mediterranean Sea, but by accident in the 1800s, turtle fishermen who were dragging nets across the bottom found that nets fouled with sponges and so began the industry here in the Americas around the Florida Keys and up the Florida coast. 
They started harvesting sponges by scraping shallow areas with rakes and pulling up the sponges they found. In the 1900s, the sponge industry shifted here to Tarpon Springs and became centralized. Many Greeks who had experience and equipment in gathering sponges in the Mediterranean came here. At the peak of the sponge industry, there were over 250 boats that would go out to collect sponges. Here the industry had divers that would go down in uh, heavy suits, uh, weighed down with lead, and some of these suits would weigh hundreds of pounds. And they had an oxygen or air line coming from the surface at the boat. It was a very dangerous job. Today, they still do this same diving, and they will dive into 45 to 60 feet of water and walk on the bottom with weighted lead boots, weighted lead around their bodies, and today, instead of scraping them up with a rake, they're required to cut them off a rock with a knife. So sponges grow on solid surfaces. And this is an example of a sponge that was taken up from the ocean. And you can see how it grows attached to this rock. The sponge divers today will take a knife and slice through the bottom of the sponge, leaving living sponge tissue and taking this part. The industry requires them not to take any sponges greater than five inches, less than five inches in diameter. But most of the sponges, as you can see from the boat, are much bigger than that. This is a sustainable industry because by cutting the sponge here, the sponge is able to grow back. We remove old sponges and the sponge that takes its place is, is more vigorous in growth than the old sponge that was here. Also, the pieces of sponge that fall off can settle to the bottom, fall on a hard place like this, and regenerate into a new sponge. And studies have found that there's actually probably more sponges, and the sponges are stimulated by these rotating harvests through area, where they remove the largest and the oldest sponges, and then these sponges are replaced by this regrowth, which is often more vigorous than the original growth. This is one of the sponge ships that goes out into the harbors and out to sea. They will stay out for sometimes a month or two until they've got a full load of sponges. This one apparently has just come back and you can see the sponges loaded up here on the deck in bags. Really, really cool to see this uh, industry, how it works, how uh, the people that do this live. It's a pretty fascinating thing to see and witness here at Tarpon Springs. Here's your original SpongeBob. I do this, I don't have to do this, but I do this for the people to pass them by and take any pictures and they look the real thing. It's because of your families, your generations. I'm here 50 years on this job. 50. Incredible, incredible. I was, uh, 19 and I'm 72. Yeah, that's awesome. I put them in a the line so I can hang it up so they can dry. Okay, cool. I washed them yesterday. This one's the dry a long time ago. I just put it up. How, how many times do you handle a sponge from when you pull it up to to uh, when you bring it out? At least 20. 20 times. It's amazing. Moving, moving, squeezing it, washing it, beating, stringing, dry it up, counting, put them in the bags, get them off the bags. Yeah. At least 20 times. Yeah. And are you still diving as yeah, well? Yeah. That's amazing. I love that part. That's amazing. I'm I bet you see. Diving, I'm going to push sponge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So are these all the same species of sponge no, or are they different? This is a wool right here. This is a vase, and this is a yellow. Fascinating. Fascinating. Which is the most valuable? This one. That one. Okay. Fantastic. And this one. Yeah. The industry has been shifted back and forth between the Mediterranean and here in Tarpon Springs, Florida, due to some natural disasters that occur. 
Here in the 1940s, a blight wiped out the sponges for 10 years or more so that the, the fishing industry for sponges dwindled to only a few boats. But in 1986, the reverse happened. A blight in the Mediterranean hammered their sponge population and the fishing industry for sponges shifted back here to the Tarpon Springs area. Beginning around 1996, red tides began to have some cyclical impact and the red tides themselves would wipe out the sponges as well. So today Tarpon Springs has a few sponging boats that still go out. Most of the world's sponges still come from here. They estimate that the business here right now is about a $2 million industry, but the town itself has a, almost $20 million in tourism. Many Greeks here, some say that this is one of the largest Greek communities in the United States, and there's many great Greek restaurants and places to go here and shop for sponges as well. Well, I hope you learned something about sponges and this unique uh, sponge industry. This is a really great place to come and visit. They also have lots of tours and sunset tours and sponge tours and, and dolphin tours that begin out of uh, this area as well. Remember, if you like what I do on this channel, please subscribe, give me a like, and leave me a comment. I love hearing from my viewers. And remember, I cover all things nature, frogs, toads, snakes, turtles, the myriapoda, insects, trees, wildflowers, and fungi. I cover all the things you might encounter just outside your door. So thanks for watching this episode in sunny Florida, Tarpon Springs, here at the sponge capital of the world. Thanks again for watching this episode of Nature at Your Door.